Good morning and welcome. I'm so glad that you can be here today to start off 2021 with the LaFleche Limerick Pastoral Church. However, you might find us. We've got some folks in our Zoom room, and if you are not watching this on Zoom at 1130 and you want to join in and be able to say hello and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to uh, friends and, and members of the congregation, feel free to jump onto the Zoom room. It doesn't uh, in, interrupt me or anything. If you come on in the middle of the service, you can just come on right in. Um, and some of you may be joining us on Facebook Live, and we're glad for that too. Others of you may have had something going on at 11.30 on Sunday morning, and this will be watching this on our website or YouTube later in the week, and we're glad that you're here as well. However you find us, we're glad that you're able to worship today. Uh, I don't have all that many announcements, just the only one that I can think of other than our regularly scheduled music announcement is that our website is www.lefleshlimerickunited.com. And on there, you can find all sorts of things, but specific for today, you can find our bulletin. If you're watching online, you will have the slides come up and you'll be able to see what's going on. Um, but if you want to have a full bulletin, either for yourself for later or to share with somebody else, it is on our website under church bulletins down at the bottom of the page. Our music license number is A609189 of One License LLC, and that is reproduced with permission. We thank Sherry School for recording and playing for us today. As we begin our worship, we do so by acknowledging the territory on which we stand, on which we live and work and worship. With respect, we acknowledge the history, spirituality, culture, and gifts of the peoples with whom Treaty 4 was signed and the Métis people who call this land home. Today, we acknowledge and accept our responsibility as treaty members. May we live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with all its people. Our call to worship today is adapted from Reverend Robert George, Karen George, and Judy Colby George. I'm guessing they're all a family. Um, and, you know, since we've been doing this uh, online, we haven't really been doing a responsive call to worship as is our tradition when we're in person. Um, but today I thought, you know what, why not? And so the, the words are going to come up on the screen. As always, you read the bolded parts. For the most part, they're very similar each time. When Jesus is born to Mary and Joseph, God is there. When he is presented at the temple, God is there. When Simeon holds Jesus in his arms, God is there. When Anna recognizes him in the temple, God is there. When Mary and Joseph search and cannot find Jesus, God is there. When he learns from and surprises the religious leaders, God is there. This very morning, God is here. In the future we cannot see, God is there. So come, let us worship God. We light our Christ candle today, remembering the light of the world that was present the beginning of time when the creator spoke that came into the world and took on human flesh in Jesus of Nazareth and lives on with us still in the breath and the flame of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray together our prayer of approach from the Feasting on the Word Worship Companion. O oh God, into a realm of clerics and kings, you sent your child to teach the wise and show the world what power there is in love. Keep us vigilant, <laughs> vigilant to hear the voices of those who speak your truth. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is number 36 in Voices United, if you have it. We are still in the season of Christmas, so you still get some Christmas songs today. Angels from the Realms of Glory. Thank you. 
that song. And it wasn't until I looked up uh, suggestions for, for hymns for today's scripture that I realized that the last verse is actually um, talking about the very first part of our scripture today. So we read Luke 2, 21 to 52. This is picking up immediately after the, uh, the part of the story where the shepherds and the angels and the shepherds go running back out into the world to tell of the Christ child. And so this picks up from there. After eight days had passed, it was time to circumcise the child. And he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. When the time came for the purification ritual, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, this child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There is also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Phanuel and the, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever heard the saying that a watched pot never boils? <laughs> Have you ever tried it out yourself? I remember when I was a kid um, trying to do science experiments. I say science experiments with quotes because I'm not sure that that really was what they were. But you know, you'd boil one pot of water and you'd completely ignore it. And then, you know, half an hour later, you'd boil another pot of water while staring at it to see if it actually took longer. It didn't, it just felt like it. 
I wonder if that's how Anna and Simeon felt as they spent their days in the temple waiting and praying. I wonder if that's how we all feel sometimes when we look at our world and wonder why doesn't God just fix everything? Why doesn't God just send another Messiah and get everything going the right way? It sometimes feels as if we're waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting some more and nothing happens. But then along come Mary and Joseph with their new son and a couple of birds to sacrifice. And all of a sudden the pot boils. Simeon and Anna recognize God's presence in the child and they rejoice. They, they share that love and that joy that they feel in that moment. In this Christmas season, as I said, we are still in the Christmas season of Christmas until we reach Epiphany in a few days. In this Christmas season, the pot boils for us as well, as we remember the holy babe, as we recognize his life all around us. This story and this season is one where the waiting moves to recognize it. In it, we find that the promise of God does not always appear as we would expect it to, but it does always appear. Christmas is that border time. We move from Advent waiting and preparing and getting ready for the Christ child to the, the piece of epiphany, which is recognizing and understanding and seeing the life of God all around us and sharing that with the world. Today, in this season of Christmas, we get both. Sometimes that liminal place between the two can be hard. It can be hard to figure out how to balance them both. But that is the joy of Christmas, that we get to wait and we get to recognize. And we get to see and know and feel that the life that God gives may not come as we expect it, but it does it does always come. So we're going to sing another hymn today. It is number 46 in Voices United, Gentle Mary Laid Her Child.
few years ago, a friend of mine gave me a book called Lamb, The Gospel According to Biff, Christ's Childhood Pal. The basic plot of the story is that Biff is resurrected in our day and age to write a new book about the life of Jesus, to write a new gospel. Having found and read the gospels that we know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Biff decides that his purpose in writing is mainly to share the stories that the other writers either didn't include or um, forgot or left out. And so the majority of the book is dedicated to what is often called the lost years uh, between Jesus's birth and the beginning of his ministry. We don't really have a whole lot in those time frames. It's a wonderful read, but it definitely does require a sense of humor about your faith. So I commend it to you to, to read if you so desire, um, but just fair warning, there is some language and some um, things that some might say were sacrilegious in it, <laughs> but it is also a very humorous book in my opinion. I read it again this week because, hey, I had some time between Christmas and New Year's and I thought that it would be fun, but also because as I started to write this week's sermon and, and think about this week's scriptures, I realized and remembered again how little we actually know about Jesus's childhood and early adult years. And the, although Lamb is a work of fiction, and I know that, it makes me laugh to think about some of the stories that might have taken place. In the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, only Matthew and Luke tell us the nativity story, that is the story of Jesus's birth. And only Luke makes any mention of Jesus's life between his birth and his baptism. And he only gives us two small short instances of that 30 year span. Those are the two that we read today. I find that really interesting. Maybe you don't, but I do. Does that mean that during that particular period of his life, Jesus was just a normal, everyday, ordinary kid and there wasn't anything special to report about him? Does it mean that everyone already knew the stories of his childhood and so the gospel writers figured they didn't need to waste ink and papyrus on telling the stories again? What exactly is so special about these two instances in the temple that they made the cut into Luke's gospel? Out of 30 years worth of stories, Luke only tells us these two. What's so special about them? In all honesty, I really don't know the answers to the first couple, but I do have a couple of thoughts about the last one. In this story, we are straddling the line between only a select few knowing Jesus's true life and calling that, you know, Mary and Joseph, the few shepherds, the Magi, and then in, in this story, Anna and Simeon kind of get added to the mix. We're straddling that line between only those select few knowing that and the news being given to the whole world in the next chapter when Jesus begins his earthly ministry. We are watching the growth of Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, the Son of God, from a child for whom everything must be done, including the rituals and the rites of the faith, to a man who teaches and preaches with authority. The first story today tells us that Jesus was brought to be presented at the temple when he was 40 days old because it was at that time that Mary needed to sacrifice for the purification ritual after childbirth. As the firstborn male child in the family, he would have also been presented and dedicated at the temple at the same time, save them a trip, they were already there. In some ways, this is like our infant baptism, where an act is done for the child, as they have not yet obtained the age of reason. While they're there, Simeon and Anna recognize that there is something special about Jesus, but we're not told that anyone else in the temple sees that, that recognizes that specialness about him. And the trip goes smoothly, other than the meeting with Simeon and Anna. 
as does every pilgrimage they take to the temple for Passover for the next few years until Jesus is 12. That's when the next story takes place and all hell breaks loose. No longer a child, but not yet fully an adult, Jesus is coming into his own in this story. He is finding his place in society as he sits and learns from the rabbis, asking them questions and answering theirs. It's important to note here that unlike in some of the later stories in the gospel, Jesus and the religious leaders are not being portrayed as being against each other. Instead, they're learning from one another. They're, they're being, they're acting in a very Jewish understanding of, of learning and knowledge that the teacher is not only the teacher, but is also the student. And that the student, even though the student has much to learn, there is also much they can teach. And so there's that back and forth that we imagine in this story. Jesus is asking questions and then the next sentence says that they are amazed by his understanding and his words. And we imagine that they must have asked him questions that he then answers. So Jesus spends some time in the temple in this story, preparing himself and in some small ways, preparing those who are with him for what he is to become and what he is to do. And when Mary and Joseph find him there, he, he leaves that place to go home with them to Nazareth, to continue to grow in wisdom and in divine and human favor. Two stories, both important to a life of faith, but so often we prefer the first to the second. We teach the children of our congregations the stories of our faith and then if sometimes if you're anything like me, you hope that they don't take them to, to heart too much because they might, if they delve too deeply, they might ask questions that we don't know the answer to. But we hope that they continue to attend and, and continue to believe, but stay with just listening and learning the stories. We do the same as adults. So often we believe because it's what we've been taught, but we don't fully examine what a certain set of beliefs means for our lives or for our faith. A little later in the story, Jesus calls us to something different. Jesus later in the story says that the children are the ones for whom the children or the kingdom of heaven belongs. They are the ones who will enter the kingdom of heaven and that only the adults who become as children will enter with them. We tend to take that as meaning that they, the children have the innocence in the faith. But I think it also means in boldness and in creativity. Children do not yet understand the custom of not asking awkward questions. They have not yet learned to limit what they say to what is acceptable or believable. Their curiosity, creativeness, and way of looking at the world offer to, an, uh, to us an example that we would do well to follow. So as we start this new year, that's my challenge to us to not let ourselves get stagnant in our faith, but to pursue it with the wonder and excitement of children. But also to know that we always have a home to come back to you when that work is hard. My favorite part of this story of the 12 year old Jesus in the temple is that at the end of it, he goes home with his parents recognizing that the home of Mary and Joseph is not his only home, he also realizes that he's had enough for the day or the three days if the story is to be believed. And he goes home with them and continues learning and growing there. We too have that home and that place of safety in this congregation and in our faith. Yes, we are called to explore boldly and with questions and wonderings. 
but we are also called to know that we are held and cared for beyond all understanding. When those deep explorations leave us feeling a little bit untethered, we are not alone because Jesus too has walked this road. And for that, we give thanks. Amen. As people of the United Church of Canada, we proclaim our faith with the words of a new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Having received the great and wonderful gifts of God, we return them now to God, returning ourselves with our time, our talents, and our treasure, our very beings, to the one who created us. And so I invite you to take this time to think about what you offer to God. If that is a monetary offering that you want to give to one or both of our congregations, we thank you for that and please get in touch with us somehow. You can get in touch with me directly or chat with one of our treasurers, Dave Sproul or Suzanne Waiting. Um, if that's not the case or if you prefer to use your monetary donations to go to some other work of God in this world, we're grateful for that too. For those who are bringing life and love and time and talents, I'm so glad that you are taking that time to think about that today. And so as we sing our offertory prayer and our offertory hymn, I invite you to take a moment and offer a prayer to God. of the people today also comes to us from feasting on the word worship companion. I invite you to hold in your hearts and minds those of our community, those of family and friends and those around the world who we may not even know who need our prayers today. So let us pray. Oh God, your messenger announces peace in shouts of breathless joy. Drive out the warring ways of our world and protect all who face danger this day as you guide our feet to travel with the one who is your peace. Your word comes with justice to rule the earth with fairness. Inspire the leaders of all nations and citizens of the world to order our economic lives to promote dignity and equality for all in our global homeland. O God of love, draw us together in peace. Mountains and rivers clap and sing as your word makes all things new. 
Awaken us to the damage we do to your world and mend our ways that all creation might breathe again the liveliness of your blessing. When shepherds met your newborn Christ, they eagerly ran to tell the news, making us joyful, make us joyful messengers of your good news, who freely share your love in the world. O oh God of love, draw us together in peace. In Jesus, your love takes on human form to seek us out and guide us home. May Christ be born in us today to lead us into the lives for which we were made. From your majesty on high to the lowliness of the stable, your word has power to sustain all things. And through him, we become your precious children. Comfort those who are hungry, sick, or suffering. O oh God of love, draw us together in peace. O oh God, receive our prayers through Christ, who is our Messiah, as we say the words that Christ taught his followers to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is number 65 in Voices United. Ring a bell for peace. go from this place to explore boldly where you have not gone before, knowing that you will never come untethered from the rock of God's love on which you stand. And as you go, may you go knowing the blessing and the love of God, who is our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer, Jesus, who is our elder brother, and the Holy Spirit of life, within you this day and evermore. 
Amen。